All right. Are you, is your, yeah, we got to get your computer up. I got to turn this all TV, over. I think the TV's got to be on. Okay. Let me turn that on. Let's see if it comes up. If it doesn't. Yeah, it might need to unplug it. We'll see. Yeah, you might need a reboot over there. No, the right feed. Yeah, well, we got to do this, if you yep. remember. There, there we is. go. Yep, perfect. Filled in. Right. Perfect. We're good there. All right, let me get this. That looks good. Actually, I'm going to do that. Oh, I need to get that little light. No, I'm going to do this light. I'm not going to do that light. Just because that can't deal with that ring. Let me see. All right, how's that? I got to do sound. Hey, Jerry Christopher. Okay. He's there. Floyd's pillow. Let's fit in this chair. All right. Are we square? Are we up? You see my head? How's that looking? You get it? Floyd's pillow. Okay. It's a cool day today. It was great. It's great. The weather was perfect. Feels like all the pollen's knocked down, dude. Yeah, but this is nice. when they came here all tonight. It's wonderful. Beautiful. How are we doing for time? Where it are we is, at? Uh, 28. All right, good. So, sounds good, everybody? Am I handsome? <laughs> are you awake? <laughs> Am I as handsome as I was last week? I'm a week older. Let's see. Lots of good news, so that's good. Let me go put our cat away. So he's, where's he at? Oh, he's just running. He's a habit. He's not a troublemaker, but he'll run. Because he knows, he knows I'm going to put him in timeout. Hi. You're going to timeout. <laughs> he does a little yeah, big mug. in jail. Is he? Is that yeah. He's just like, let me know. I, I, I'm not in agreement. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I beg to differ. That's most of what kids are doing. Yeah. 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 I do not agree with this. Yeah, it was actually one of my, uh, in grad school, it's probably, is it 6.30 yet? I won't tell the story. Uh, yeah, well, we got um, one minute. All right, so yeah, so when I was in grad school, one of the, uh, one of the guys in grad school with me graduated from Duke, and he said uh, we were we were doing this we were doing this chant at basketball games that was rather obscene, and he said we all got collectively as a student body called before the dean, who who said this is not how we represent Duke. He said so the chant after that rather than be obscene was. We beg to differ. <laughs> we <laughs> beg to differ. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yes, that's very dookie. <laughs> uh, all right, probably got 6.30. Oh. Hey, thanks for being here. Welcome. Good news. Good news. We, are, uh, we will be meeting in the lodge on Sunday morning at 10.30. Uh, John Rains, David Strong, and I were over there with Geneva Green today checking out the audiovisual and all that. The way you'll get in is you get in, you'll go in from the side entrance under, under the pavilion. You'll go in there, bring your little card, bring your little member card thing. Let me go get mine really quick here.
They want you to ring in. We haven't rung in in a long yeah. time. Yeah. Well, that's here. That's what I'm saying. So bring this. Bring this. Find it. <laughs> you haven't used it in a year, but find it. Because I don't know what they're going to do. The little badge reader doesn't work. So, but they may want to see it. I don't know why they'd want to see it because your name isn't on it. But anyway, that's, uh, that's um, as you're going by, by the, front, the front desk there on the way to the room. And we are in that main ballroom there down by the stage is where we're at. So through the side entrance, by the pavilion, uh, you're going in that door there. Bathrooms will be available to us. I couldn't understand why they were asking the question or why. You know, are you guys going to want the bathrooms? Yes, of course we're going to want the bathrooms. So, so we've got the bathrooms. There's The tables are already set up in there. There's four to, a, four to a table. I promised them that we would not move the tables. I didn't say anything about the chairs. So, And they didn't ask. They didn't say anything about the chairs. So if you want to move a chair here and there, that's fine. But we're not moving tables anywhere. The other thing is the air conditioning unit is set. It's cool in there, so bring a sweater or something to throw over your shoulders if you're if you're cold anyway. You know, bring uh, make dress appropriately. You can always take your sweater off, but uh, if you're sitting there cold, um, yeah. yeah in, yeah, but but yeah, bring a sweater or something because the room is a little bit cool and we cannot adjust the temperature in that room. It is automatically set by some robo machine. So, but that's that. Um, Sunday morning, so we're meeting at the lodge. Uh, uh, David and Gracia cannot be with us for the month of May. So Floyd will be teaching uh, this coming Sunday. Marty Granger from Ministry Alliance will teach the next Sunday. I'm going to teach the Sunday after that. And then uh, Floyd will be back again on the 30th. And David, uh, in theory, uh, we'll see how this plays out. David's up in Pennsylvania right now. Joey's a little sick. And um, Amanda had a, um, one of the girls, Angelina, had a graduation um, up there at, at James Madison. And so he's up, in, he's up that way. So, But that's where we're going. I kind of got, you know, there's, there's a suspicion that the, lot, the lake house probably won't open maybe until September, but we only have uh, two more weeks after this on Thursday nights anyway uh, for, uh, for Thursday nights. We will meet at the, at the lodge on Sunday mornings from here until the lake house opens back up because they have, they have a strong preference that we meet at the lake house on Sunday mornings uh, when it does open up just for uh, conflicts with other groups that, that want to do things on Sundays. And, um, and they can use the, the lodge, for, uh, lodge for that. So that's where we are. Wednesday morning breakfast with the guys. We met in that little canopy area over there on the side of La Peep that in the year we've been going there, I never noticed it was even there. I thought it was, I thought it was actually, La Peep was actually had wall, had places you know, on both sides of it. I didn't realize, I didn't even notice that little alley there that, has that, but that was a lot of fun. A lot of guys there. So Wednesday morning, 8.30 at La Peep. Uh, be there. I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, May 18th, Women's Fellowship, 1 to 3 o'clock at the, at the Lodge. Deborah Bowshots has a Southern Storyteller uh, that's uh, from 1 to 3 o'clock. Uh, and she's got, so read that email. Uh, she's got some sort of chicken picking lunch or brown bag uh, that was there too. So. Uh, but read that for the details on that. Thanks for being here. I will open in prayer, and I'm going to turn this over to, to Floyd. Father, thank you for your great kindness to us and the excitement that's, uh, that's uh, brewing about finally being able to get it together again as a body of believers. I know it's Mother's Day uh, this, uh, this coming Sunday, and a lot of the moms have um, will be with family or or. Uh, have other plans for Mother's Day and can't be with us, but we do look forward to uh, the, when we can all get together as as, uh, as a body of believers and, and just encourage one another and enjoy each other's company. We will spend eternity together. Might as well start now. So thank you for your great kindness to us. Be with Floyd tonight as he's teaching us uh, your word. May we know you better, understand you better, and be different, be changed, be more... Um, like Jesus for it. We ask this in your name. Amen. Here's Floyd. Oh, 
Thank you, Bob. Well, it's 3, 2, 1, folks. We have May 6, 3. May 13, 2. May 20, 1, and we're done for the uh, spring. So what we're going to do is just continue our Mark study. And it kind of gets us to a place in chapter 3 where uh, is, a, is, a, is a break, a natural break in Mark. So we'll just uh, leave it like that, and then we'll just pick it back up when we start again in September. Uh, if you have your Bible and you want to open up to Mark chapter 1, verse 40, we're going to look at verses 40, the rest of that chapter, and then, then chapter 2, verse 12, uh, 1 to 12. Uh, this segment goes together because it tells us about a couple very interesting miracles. And so we're going to be talking about the uh, miracles, the divine part, and the human part tonight. Now, just again to give us a little bit of perspective in Mark, remember that the, the central pivotal proclamation of Jesus at the end almost of chapter 10, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark's presentation of Christ is the servant of the Lord, the servant son. But notice in this uh, verse, you have Christ's service to not to be served, but to serve and Christ's sacrifice to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, what that basically says as far as how Mark uh, falls uh, together is that uh, most of Mark chapter one to 10 it covers the three and a half years of the Lord's service ministry as the servant son here uh, in um, in the Israel, and then the chapter eleven to sixteen, Christ's sacrifice, that close of Mark, and he Mark sort of uh, changes gears and gets very slow and detailed right up to the end. Uh, let's just get another new something or other if we can here. Matthew, when you compare Matthew to Mark, Matthew has lots of sermons. Think of the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters. Think of a, a variety of other messages that are there in Matthew. Matthew stresses Christ's words, and then his works, his miracles, confirm those words. Mark sort of turns the pocket inside out, and Mark emphasizes the Lord's works that validate his words. And that's what we're, we're seeing here as we dig in here to, to Mark. So now let's just kind of consider two miracles uh, tonight, and maybe just a little bit in general about miracles before we dive right in. But two miracles that we're going to see tonight. First, there is a leprous man healed, and this miracle gives us the reason for it, proof to the priests at the end there of chapter uh, 1, verses 44, 45, right in there. Proof to the priests. Then there's a paralytic man uh, healed, and that's a puzzle to the scribes. The scribes are the ones that interact with Jesus in chapter 2, 1 to 12. So this is what we're going to consider today, the leprous man and the paralytic man. In general, about miracles, just to give you a little background, miracles are not, in the Bible are not like Grimm's fairy tales, okay? There are no princes turned to frogs. There are no frogs turned into princes. There are no trees that are sent walking away. There are no little teacups that start talking, okay? This is not a miracle in the Bible. In the Bible, there is something, uh, an event that obviously is extraordinary, but it's, it's to get the gaze of the people. Now, even the devil can do that, get the gaze of the people, but miracles grab your attention. But then there is a step of grandeur. It fits within the framework of what is, in fact, creation and nature. There is no people turn to frogs kind of thing. But you, what you have is something that fits within the, uh, the, uh, the order of nature, and it uh, kind of glorifies God's creation. But then there's glory, and the glory is always given to God. And that's the, the, the specific purpose of miracles as the Lord uh, begins to, to operate and do more of these miracles, and we're going to have more discussions specifically of them as we go through Mark. Now, 
I like to say there are two kinds of miracles. There are grade A and grade B. Now, let me explain. <laughs> That's just my category. I just call them grade A, grade B miracle. Grade A miracle is a miracle of creation. This is where there wasn't something and now there is. This is where there was a fellow with a withered arm, a withered hand, and, and, it, and he didn't even have the bone. He didn't have the muscles. He didn't have the, the tendons. They weren't there. And the Lord says, stretch out your hand. Well, I can't stretch it out. My hand's withered. Stretch out your hand. And he stretches it out, and suddenly it's whole and new and fresh. It was a miracle of creation, you see. Jesus turns water into wine. Now, grapes do that. Well, they turn it into grape juice. Uh, every year they turn water into grape juice, and we turn it into wine sometimes. But the point is, that was a miracle and more of creation. Well, how does that differ with miracles of providence? Think of Paul and Silas thrown in the jail in Philippi. The Lord sent an earthquake. The earthquake rattled the door so violently that they flew open and even the the thing the the rings or whatever were holding the chains of the prisoners pulled away from the stone because they were moving so much with the earthquake and the prisoners were free scared the jailer half to death he was ready to kill himself now why is that grade b that's a miracle of providence because earthquakes happen all the time but this one happened on cue, as sent by God. That's providence. See, that's providence. The difference between creation and providence. So a couple different kinds of miracles that you see uh, that will happen. Storms always calm. Sooner or later, they calm, right? But boy, when they calm at the voice of Jesus, and they lay down all those waves like little puppy dogs, quiet, and the wind ceases its howling as they're going across the Sea of Galilee, hey, that's a miracle, but it happens all the time, but it's a miracle of providence on Jesus's cue, you see? Now, once more, uh, one more detail about miracles in general. Miracles often come with sign value. That is, they are visual portrayals of larger truths than the event itself. Now, feeding the 5,000, for instance, it really was a great miracle to feed 5,000 men besides women and children. I mean, that's a big miracle. And it was, it was wonderful to feed all those people. But there's something more than just feeding those people. Jesus uses this as to explain that he's the bread of life. And Jesus is feeding the people in the wilderness just like Moses fed the people with manna. God gave the manna, and that was through Moses. And this has got a little larger truth there, a sign value that one like Moses has risen up, a prophet, uh, just like prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, just like Moses. See, there are some miracles that are like that. Healing the blind, often because the Lord is illustrating that Israel is blind to the truth of their Messiah. And so when we come now to what we're going to look at tonight, the leprous man and the paralytic man, I think what we have here too is something that points beyond just the event, but also helps us understand a little bit more kind of symbolic of human sinfulness and the devastating results of our fall into sin. So with that little background, let's uh, dive in, shall we? And we're going to start there with... Um, the context of verse 40, and that context is just going to be the last couple of verses that we looked at last week. Chapter 1, verses 38 and 39. You remember when just people were just thronging Jesus and, and Jesus kind of got away to pray and, and then Peter finally finds him and says, Lord, everybody's looking for you. <laughs> and Jesus said, I know, but I've got to go other places. Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. He came to spread the word, the word of the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom. And he went throughout all Galilee. So we have that little bit of a time gap, see? A statement that tells us this isn't just all happening in one day. Now he's going throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And this was Jesus barnstorming all over Galilee, spreading the word. 
And now we come and see that Mark is going to zero in on two events, specific events, not just general, all over Galilee, but two specific events, and they have uh, lots of meaning in them. So let's look at it. First off, the lep leprous man healed proof to the priests. What we have in, <clears throat> in chapter 1, beginning there at verse uh, 40, and a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, do you see that? Begging, kneeling down in front of Jesus, and said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, compassion, Jesus, he stretched out his hand and touched him. Wow, he touched the leprous man. Probably hadn't had a human touch in years, as long as he's been a leper. Jesus touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Simple, powerful statement. I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Now there's so much in here. So let's talk just a little bit about leprosy in general. Many people have thought that, well, the Bible misunderstands leprosy. You know what? The, the word for leper and leprosy is a broad category and it's delineated, explained to us in the book of Leviticus. It touches many things. It's more than just Hansen's disease as we like to talk about it here today in our modern science. It's more than just something that attacks the, the, the uh, uh, warning system of our body, the nerves, so that my fingers don't feel when I touch something hot or, or I don't feel when I cut my toe when I stub the toe or something. See, it, it's more than that. This is a variety of different skin disorders, and in the, in, the, in the scriptures at least, and even to the fact that some of this, the same stuff, whatever it is, even goes to, as far as the, the whitewash or the, the, the sealant inside walls of homes can break out with some of these weird things, and, or even in clothing. So leprosy in the scriptures is more than just Hansen's disease. Hansen's disease is bad enough. It's, it's horrible. I remember reading the story of a missionary named uh, Paul Brand. He worked in third world uh, mission hospitals, developing world, and, and uh, he would uh, try to help the best that he could people who were leprous, that is, with Hansen's disease. And he would, his, his theory was this, we'll do what we can now, and we'll send them home with a cat, and that cat will keep the mice from chewing on their bodies. That was his particular way of helping. Can you imagine your body not knowing some, some little critter is gnawing on your toes or your fingers while you're asleep? See, it's a horrible thing to think about. Now, that's part of what the Bible calls leprosy, but it's a little more than, than that. Uh, some of those who've tried to dig in and explain to us how the Jewish community felt about this, uh, Trench says it this way, it was the outward visible sign of inherent spiritual corruption. Unfortunately, it got to the place where if someone had leprosy and they had to be isolated outside the community, then their, their, the, the old fingers began to wag. You must have done something really bad. There's some really bad sin down deep inside that caused this corruption to be shown on the outside. Well, that's unfortunate, but that's, that's what happened in history. Hughes says it this way, it's insidious beginnings, it's slow progress, it's destructive power, <clears throat> and ultimate ruin it brings makes it a powerful symbol of moral depravity. It does symbolize for us how our own moral depravity wrecks and ruins our lives. He says, if we see ourselves with spiritual eyes, we see that apart from the work of Christ, we would be, de we would be decaying forms of walking dead. Now, he's not talking about zombies. He's talking about the spiritual condition that we are in 
it doesn't get any better outside of Christ. And the longer we live, the older we are, you know, that depravity just gets a deeper and deeper and deeper root system in our, in our uh, lives. Josephus, there in that first century, talks about uh, lepers and how they were treated as if they were, in effect, dead men. Dead. Why? They isolated them. They put them outside the camp in, in, in Israel's journeys. And then even there were isolation places living apart when Israel was in the land. Can you imagine being in the mall and meeting someone with a mask on? Okay, you probably could today, can't you? You can imagine that. But what if you were in a mall and someone had his clothing torn, his hair was all disheveled, and he had a mask, and he was going around saying, unclean, unclean, what would you do? I'd be running the other direction. Now that's what those who were lepers often did and were told to do to be able to keep the spread of this dread uh, infection from happening. For instance, let's look at Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. The Lord explaining here, the leprous person who has the disease. Now he's talking to the priests, Leviticus, talking to the Levites and the priests because they're the ones that have to determine whether a person is or is not leprous. You see, the priests were not healers. They were not healers. They couldn't heal the leper. All they did was recognize this is, this isn't. This is, and now after a while, hey, it's gone, and you can come back in. Because the people were isolated away from the community. Can you imagine being shunned like that? Well, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let his hair and his, of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Now that is isolation. That is a horrible existence. Molokai, one of those islands over in Hawaii, at one point in our history, was a large leprous colony where people were sent to that one place. But living alone, living only with those that were suffering from the same disease. Now back to our text again. When we, when we look at this, consider a little bit more the, the, the um, appeal of the leper, if you will. If you will, you can make me clean. Now I've heard some say, well, we shouldn't pray. You know, Lord, if this is your will, please heal me. We shouldn't do that. We should be in faith and just trust the Lord and just, just claim your faith healing. Now, now, wait a minute. This leprous man, the fact that he was able to come and approach Jesus and get on his knees and beg, that demonstrated his faith. But he said, if you will, if you will. There's nothing wrong with that. The Lord is the one that then says, I will be clean. Now, when you think about that, think about not every sickness do we have immediate healing. Sometimes the Lord uses intermediaries, the medical profession. Sometimes the Lord uh, does things that take time, but we slowly get better. Sometimes, like the Apostle Paul, the Lord has other purposes in mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, he got so many revelations from God. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded, just like that leprous man implored the Lord. I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But what happened? But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes the Lord has other goals in mind for us, and it doesn't always happen that we get 
cured so quickly. Therefore, Paul said, I'm going to go around with a long face and grouse all day long. No, he didn't say that. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Maybe you ought to be thankful that the Lord hasn't given you lots of revelations. Because <laughs> look what Paul had to endure because of, of his being such a minister for the Lord. For the sake of Christ, verse 10, Paul says, Then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Lord has different things that he's doing in our lives. So don't think that one size fits all. Thank God that we know when we again consider what the uh, the leprous man uh, did. If I go back the other direction, let me go here and just show this one more time. When, when he comes to the Lord, it says that in verse 41, he was moved with pity. This communicates to us that our Lord Jesus, the Son of God, is compassionate. And he identifies with our suffering. So no matter in what stage of a problem, a, a sickness that you're at, remember the Lord identifies with you. For this leper, he stretched out his own hand and he touched him letting him know that he did identify with him. And he said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left. Not always does that happen that way, as we saw with Paul. But what we have here is then Jesus giving this man a specific uh, instruction. Jesus sternly charged him. Now, that means sternly. Okay? <laughs> now listen, I don't want you going around blabbing about this everywhere. Now, what this kind of shows me is that Jesus wasn't trying to pump up the spectac spectacular in his ministry. He wasn't trying to broadcast and, and get to photo ops of, of him healing people so he could get bigger crowds. That wasn't Jesus. What he was doing was downplaying the spectacular. He wanted people to focus on his, his words, not just his works. But he sternly charged this man and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but, now look at this, go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. A proof to them. <laughs> now what we have here then is that the Lord is sending notice to the Levitical priesthood. Now you think about that. How long, if this man would have done this, how long had it been since a cleansed leper had come and presented himself or herself before a priest and was asking for this particular practice in Leviticus 14, as Leviticus 13 to 14 deals the most with leprosy, but verses 2 to 4, this is what the Lord commanded Moses. This shall be the law of a leprous person for the day of his cleansing. And then he just, just give you a little bit of it. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp. Now you see, the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. So he's still in isolation. Then if the case of leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take with him, take for him, who is to be cleansed, two living clean birds and seated wood and scarlet, and then goes on with a whole bunch of, of uh, detailed cleansing procedure. But the point here is just the priest is the one that sees it, declares it, and once the man is cleansed ritually, he is admitted back into the community. The isolation is over. So what did our, our man do? Back in our text, Jesus said, you go and you show yourself to the priest and offer for cleansing what Moses commanded is proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it. Oh, kind of a shame. He disobeyed Jesus' stern warning, huh? Oh, I know he was excited. I'm sure he was. And he began to spread the news so that, notice this, Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in deserted, desolate places and people were coming to him from 
from every part. Now, what you have there then is kind of a, a, a limitation put on Christ's ministry because of one person who was healed of leprosy, one person's disobedience. Well, we ought, ought to thank the Lord for any time that we get healing and make sure that we give God the glory, but we need to listen and obey the Lord when the Lord gives us specific instructions, huh? Now, when we go on from there, we get into our second miracle for the night. Not only a leprous person, and you remember, the focus there was on corruption and isolation. Boy, think of what sin has done for us, to us. Sin has corrupted our nature. When Adam and Eve sinned, and here we are, oh, we can be, quote, basically good. Well, what, what do we mean by we're, humans are basically good? What, what does that mean? You know, people say that just glibly. Well, people are basically good. Well, all of us know that we haven't always done the good. <laughs> all of us know that when we had an opportunity to do right, we didn't always do what was right. So even though there may be, you know, if you want to try to start putting percentages on our actions, that's one thing. But there is something at heart in our human nature that is twisted, that needs to be corrected. And that's what separates us from God. That's what has isolated us from the kingdom. But Jesus comes and he says, I will be clean. He wants us to be close and included. Now comes the paralytic man who's going to be healed. And this is a puzzle to the scribes. Uh, look how the, this paragraph begins, verses 1 and 2. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, now did you notice that? He returned to Capernaum. So the leprous man was probably out there when Jesus was barnstorming around and then suddenly he meets this leprous man and he confronts Jesus and he begged him and he knelt before him and Jesus reached out and touched him and cleansed him. Now he returns to that city at the top of the Sea of Galilee, caps off the Sea of Galilee, returned to, commit, uh, to Capernaum after some days. And it was reported that he was at home. So then what happens? And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. Just thronging Jesus uh, constantly. But look what Jesus was doing. This was his primary purpose. He was preaching the word to them. Preaching the word. When you see that phrase, preaching the word, you want to think, chapter 1, verse 14, when Jesus came on the scene, he was preaching the gospel of God, saying that the kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. See, this is what preaching the word means. Jesus wasn't giving them 16 sermons on Second Chronicles. See, I know that sometimes, and even at seminary, where I went, I was taught that preach the word means you want to be expositor. You want to dig into the scriptures and make sure you, you preach the word. Well, I agree that expository preaching is the best way to preach, explaining the scriptures and teaching the scriptures, but the phrase, preach the word, is really talking about preaching the gospel. And even the founder of the seminary that I went to, Dallas Theological Seminary, the founder, Lewis Perry Chafer, said, 75% of your preaching ought to be the gospel. So sometimes we get a little bit out of phase, I think, when we think preaching the word. But Jesus preached the word. He's preaching the gospel, the gospel of God, the good news that what God has erupted into our history and is at work in the life of this one that we call Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. But then what happens? There are so many people listening to Jesus' speaking that there came at that point a group of five. They came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So there's a paralytic and four men. And there's such a crowd that they can't get in the house. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. So these fellows get a little bit 
audacious, if you will, and they climb up on the roof and they begin to tear apart the roof. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, let's unpack just a, a little bit more of that. Just think, they dared to do what was difficult to bring their, 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 their buddy, their friend, this, this paralyzed fellow to Jesus Four of them, it, 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 it's a lot of work. And then they climbed up on the roof. They did the unorthodox, tearing a guy's roof apart. Now, you know, when I first read that, when I was well, younger, I thought, oh, that's just a thatch roof. They just pulled back the, you know, pulled back the thatch and let him down. You know, the houses back in those days, if it was kind of a Syrian style, if you will, was really of branches and mud and even tiles. Luke chapter 5, when Luke explains this same event, he says they tore apart the tiles. So this is not a thatched roof. This is a heavy duty breaking it apart. So think about what's going on here. <laughs> Number one, Jesus didn't mind that there was a departure from following the order of service. Sometimes people just get bent out of shape if anything goes awry from what we set out in the bulletin. No. Hey, this is an interruption. He's not concerned about that. And he doesn't express his disapproval to the crowd at all. Think about this scene. Above, four sweaty men, no doubt, and their friend, and they're dropping debris, tearing open... Can you imagine taking it off the tiles and here's the, the mud and the branches and they're, they're breaking through these mud, this mud and branches and, uh, and, and then the, the, uh, it's, it's falling down on the people down below <laughs> and guess who are the people down below? The scribes are sitting there in verse 6. The scribes are sitting there. Luke's passage says scribes and Pharisees were sitting there. And here comes this stuff down on them. And finally, the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger until they can let down their friend right in front of them. So above, there is this these four friends and tearing apart the roof and the stuff dropping down. Below, there was a crowd with the scribes sitting there in verse 6 and the Pharisees. Above were these men who believed that Jesus could heal. Below, there were some, what I'm going to call, paralytic scribes and paralytic Pharisees. They had a hard time believing. And then what happens next is that Jesus is going to say very simply, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, this is the faith of the group. It isn't just that the person sick had to have faith. No. If you just have, no, no the, their faith he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Wow, that's powerful. What does he mean by that? I thought he was sick. I thought he was paralyzed. I, I, I thought he needed help. Well, you know, this may point to an issue, if you will, that, um, you know, there could have been something that was deeper than just the paralysis. Uh, and now that this is known even in medicine and psychiatry, dissociative uh, disorders where someone can feel so guilty about something that they go blind. I remember now, this is a true story. One of my professors, John Hanna, Dallas Theological Seminary, he was talking to us about the days that he was just was asked to start teaching at Dallas, finishing his doctorate, spending so much time finishing his dissertation. He knew he was neglecting his children. He knew he was neglecting his wife. And after he spent all this time and he finished and got done, he went blind, his own testimony. He went blind for three months. And he worked through the issue and the Lord gave him sight back. Now, that's what you call kind of a disso dissociative. He had been reading, reading, reading so much, but the Lord brought him back. Now, look, I, I don't know what this man had, but Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. There's something deeper in there. 
Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? Well, he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus knows what's going on in their heart. And so verses 8 and 9, And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, now notice, to say, not to do. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk. Which is easier? That's a good question. They don't give an answer. So what Jesus goes on to say, but that you may know that the Son of Man, notice, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He's putting the point of the spear right in their chest. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. He can say both, but he can also say, son, your sins are forgiven, because Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He is the servant son, but he is more than a man, you see, and he was, he was forcing them to face that particular issue. Now, there's something kind of interesting here. This comes from missionary lore, if you will. <laughs> Uh, in Spanish, this passage in the scripture is, is uh, rise, take up your bed. Levántate y toma tu lecho, take up your bed. Y anda, and walk. But a missionary was preaching a whole sermon, and this is passed around from one missionary campfire to the next. And when he gets uh, to this place, he says, toma tu leche, y anda. Well, what does that mean? Take up your bed and see the word take. If you pick up a thing, it's take. But if you take a drink a liquid, it's take the liquid. It's drink the liquid. So he's saying, <laughs> the man was saying, rise, drink your milk and go. <laughs> well, that's just a funny story. But, you know, it's passed around quite a bit. Um, but the point here, though, is very, very serious. And the paralytic man gets up off of his lecho. Now, lecho kind of tells us what kind of bed it was. You know, like it's just a, it's like a sleeping bag. It's, it's just like a, a, a cot with, with no stick, no stand. And, and, and he takes up his, his bed, he rolls it up, and he goes. Wow. Well, he arose, immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them, before them all, so that they were all amazed and, notice, glorified God. What did we say? Miracles, get your gaze. They fit within the grandeur of what is creation. The Lord restored this man to a healthy body. And then the people said, we never saw anything like this. Wow, can you see them? So what you've got here then is a miracle truly done to, to help these folks realize that what God is doing in their life, God has shown up and the Lord is at work and give glory to God. Now, as we wrap it up tonight, I'm going to ask you, how can Jesus exercise God's authority on us? Think about these two passages. If you will, the leprous man was healed, corruption and separation. What can the Lord do? He can cleanse your heart. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's sanctification. And then he brings us near. We who are far off, he brings us near. God's authority is what brings us into his kingdom. This was proof to the priests that God has shown up and is working in Messiah Jesus to cleanse and to include all who come to him. The paralytic man, well, he was unable to walk. His inability due to sin, possibly. And Jesus forgave the sin and he healed the man. What we have here, even though it was a puzzle to the scribes, Messiah Jesus has authority to forgive sin 
and it's confirmed by his miraculous work. We need to thank God that he has sent his son and that we are able to get close to him through his cleansing and to know that even though we are unable to save ourselves, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, and he is the one that by his grace brings us into the kingdom of God. If you've never let Jesus exercise God's authority in your life, this would be a wonderful day to do that. Lord, bless your word. Keep our hearts warm through it. And Lord, if anyone's eyes need to be open, I pray that you would open them now. And may they reach out to you and may you, Lord, touch them with your cleansing power in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week. See you Sunday. See you Sunday first, huh? Sunday at the Lodge. Sunday at the Lodge.